But um, you ever feel like sometimes you're at a crossroads in life? Like you're not going this way, not going that way. You sort of feel like nothing's going on. You're at an in-between time, sort of in neutral, maybe waiting to uh, see when you can put, put the, the lever in, in drive or first gear, however, if you're a stick shift person, whatever, and to take off. You ever feel that way? In a sense, <clears throat> you know, our lives, I think, are more like that than anything else. I mean, quite often, we just sort of feel like we're always in that in-between time. And maybe it's not quite right for this, not quite right for that, or whatever. Or you feel like you're not exactly where you want to be, and you're sort of in this in-between time. And as we'll see here in this point in Israel's history, and if you know much about th this period of time, uh, this is what uh, Rabbi Chaim has been, we've been in this sort of epic of time. Uh, I've been in this book in particular, Ezra, as well as Zechariah, but if you read Ezra, Nehemiah, Zechariah, uh, Haggai, these are all at the end of Second Chronicles. This is all uh, either right at or before, you know, you kind of at this in-between time, and now what was read today is sort of a, a new chapter, sort of a moving on period from a, 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 from a time before that was just sort of an in-between, almost seemed like a time of, of neutral for, for, for the nation of Israel. And um, but as we'll see, hopefully, as we, as we go through this message, or as you read the, these section, this section of scripture on your own, or these books, um, and it's good to actually read them as, as sort of a unit, because sometimes you, you think you read them separately, but these are all together. You know, you're reading in Ezra, and it talks about, and Nehemiah said this, and Haggai said that. Well, go back and read uh, Zechariah and, and Haggai and see. These, these were the, the sermons that are being talked about in Ezra and Nehemiah, these other books, if you know what I mean. But I think you'll hopefully see for yourself that being at an in-between time in your life uh, is, uh, doesn't necessarily mean that nothing is happening. And it's all part of, of God's plan. But it doesn't mean that when you're in these times that it we, means we just sit back uh, as spectators. Okay? And so the big picture, um, again, what's going on here, and sort of the ending picture of what Linda read is that the time, the time had come for the exiles to, uh, to leave and to return to Jerusalem to restore their community, to rebuild uh, their temple, and to renew their, their worship of the Lord. And God was now moving. You, you see that God is now moving as, as things kind of get out of neutral. And you see that he begins to work and there's activity that's going on from outside of the community. Uh, we see that with the king and so forth. I mean, these are things that, that, that are just sort of like, wow, you know, this happened out of the blue. Um, so you see that God's doing things with, with regard to things outside of the community, as well as things that are going on inside of the community. And we're going to look at some of that as well. And this is all happening according to prophecy. And so I want to just give us a little bit of a contextual picture uh, of this, uh, of what's going on here. So I want to go back and just look at a couple, two places we're going to look at in addition to, to looking at what was read by Linda today. I want to go back to the very beginning of Ezra. If you have your Bibles, you can go back just to the very beginning of chapter 1. Uh, I'm going to read uh, chapter one, starting chapter 1-1 one, one, um, in a few verses following, and then I want to skip to the prophecy part. Because right here in, in chapter um, 1, in verse 1 of Ezra, it says this, it says, in the first year of King Cyrus of Persia, in order that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be accomplished, that's the prophecy part that we're going to look at in a second, the Lord stirred up the spirit of King Cyrus of Persia so that he sent a herald throughout all his kingdom and also a written edict declared, Thus says King Cyrus of Persia, The Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he has charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem in Judah. Any of those among you who are of his people, may their God be with them, are now permitted to go up to Jerusalem in Judah and rebuild the house of the Lord, the God of Israel. He is the God who is in Jerusalem, and, all, and let all survivors in whatever place they reside be assisted by the people of their place with silver and gold, with goods and with animals, besides free will offerings for the house of God in Jerusalem. And if you've never thought about this before, this is kind of like a mini picture of the Exodus, quite frankly. This idea of being kind of going out of bondage, exile, and being taken somewhere and being helped by the people and given gold and so forth. And a little mini, another second Exodus, if you've never thought of that before. 
So that's what's going on here. This is kind of what starts this picture, and that the ending is what, what Linda uh, read today. After that edict and different things that people gathered and so forth, and we, we saw what happened at the end. But according to the word uh, of the Lord, it says in, Ez in Ezra 1.1. So I want to go back, if you've got your Bibles there, if you want to go to uh, Jeremiah chapter 29. There's a couple places in Jeremiah. They have chapter 22, but also 29. I want to read 29 uh, because there's a, probably a passage that's very familiar to you, and you may or may not have realized that it's part of this, you know, going from Babylon to, to Jerusalem. But Jeremiah chapter 29, verses 1, um, read 1 through 11, but I may skip a little, a few verses as we go. It says, These are the words of the letter that the prophet Jeremiah sent from Jerusalem to the remaining elders among the exiles, and to the priests, the prophets, and all the people whom Nebuchadnezzar had taken into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. I'm going to skip down a few verses. And this is what the letter said. It said, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and live in them. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Take wives and have sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage, that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there and do not decrease. But seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile. And pray to the Lord on its behalf. For in its welfare, you will find your welfare. So pausing just for a moment, you know, just for a small application for us, of course, in these times when you feel stuck in the middle, things aren't necessarily where you might want them to be, um, don't stop living. You know, that's sort of the, 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 the admonition from God here. Don't stop living. God has not abandoned you, and he's still telling you, even in this situation, to, to go on about your life. I've not left you. So skipping down a few more verses, he says, the final declaration here, the one that you may be even more familiar with than the build houses and live in them, plant gardens and so forth. It says, For thus says the Lord, only when Babylon's 70 years are completed will I visit you, and I will fulfill to you my promise and bring you back to this place. For surely I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans for your welfare and not for harm, to give you a future with hope. So that famous verse, I think, is often quoted, usually in the context of, you know, don't worry, I know things are looking down for you right now, but don't worry about it. God's got great plans for you. You're going to succeed. You're going to overcome. You're going to do better and so forth. But hopefully I think you see here in this context of Jeremiah where, this, where that passage really is, it really has to do with the fact that, yes, don't worry. Um, things are going to get better um, according to God's plans and in God's time and in God's ways. That's the real context of what that that often quoted passages about plans to prosper you and success and so forth. So we, and we have been talking for uh, at least the last year or so, I say we, this, this community, this ministry, Yeshua Tzion, um, we've been sort of saying that, you know what, something's, uh, something's kind of been different for us in this ministry in a sense. We feel like it's a transition time for us. But just like you see in Ezra 1, I mean, things kind of came out of the blue, and it's, it's not that they did anything different. It's that the Lord stirred up the heart of the king, and it had to do with it being the time for this to happen. It had to be the fact that it was according to prophecy. In the same way, uh, we at Yeshua Tzion, I think you, you would admit or agree that we haven't really done anything different either. We're not, we're not sort of changing our direction or our focus necessarily. We may have made, made tweaks here and there or what have you, but we're not doing anything really different. But... Nonetheless, we're not in the same place in a lot of ways, physically and, and mentally, um, that we were uh, a year ago. And in a real sense, it is a new time for us as well, an appointed time, I believe a time that, that God has set aside as well. But I want to, again, I want to re revisit what I said a few minutes ago, that being time, when I say time, being the time, the appointed time, um, does not equal the lack of a need to do work or the, the, the fact or... or being the time doesn't mean no effort on, on your part, on my part, on our part. We see in this story in Ezra, we see that there was uh, the work that God did outside the community, like I mentioned, stirring up the heart of the king and so forth. But notice also um, all the other effort from within the community that takes place when they're, when they're kind of putting it into gear and moving out to, uh, to Jerusalem. The amount of, of help that was needed 
Uh, you just kind of got the tail end with what Linda read, but the amount of help that was needed, the stuff and all that, it was tremendous. It was a tremendous, although it was the appointed time and God had stirred up the heart of the king and it was according to prophecy, there was a tremendous amount of, of effort that went into this. Um, in fact, you know, you read the different accounts uh, in Nehemiah and Ezra and they're all, there's reasons for the slight differences in numbers. The numbers are, if you're a numbers person, uh, there's all these numbers here. There's some differences in numbers and there's some explanations, but in general, um, I mean, there was over 40,000 people that were involved in this effort. 40,000 people that were involved, not just involved, but that were needed as well. When you go through the lists that, were, that are prior to what Linda read, and it lists all the people, kind of enumerating this, this 40 plus thousand people, you see that there's a general population. There's just people that are going, and where they're from, and their different families and so forth. But then you see um, the priests. And you see the number of servants, the number of gatekeepers, um, the number of singers, and all of these people were there, and they were absolutely needed as they took this, you know, four-month trek uh, to Jerusalem, lugging all kinds of stuff, uh, the things that the, the king had actually brought out for them, all the, the, the previously taken items and so forth from the temple, and originally those were returned, and so there was a, this was a big, big effort that took place. And I want to say that likewise, um, with us at Yeshua Tzion, this ministry, you know, it's been, uh, we've, we've been established by God, uh, sustained by God for over a quarter of a century. Um, and while we're, we're not in exile per se, I wouldn't put us in, in the exile category, I would say that we're, we're certainly currently in this, in this kind of in-between in between states. Because again, even though they were in exile, there was, God had said, this is what's going to happen. But so we're, we're kind of in that same situation, I think, in an in-between place where, you know, we're, we're raising money for, for a, a more permanent home for ourselves um, due to the, 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 the work that we've seen God doing here with us from raising money and actively looking for a building um, of our own, we're looking to pack up and move out to a new area, which is uncharted waters for a lot of us. Lots of questions, a lot of, you know, a lot of concerns maybe, a lot, a lot of question marks and so forth. But again, we also believe that this is the time. This is uh, the appointed time for us as well. And because of that, I believe likewise, we also need to expect, and we've seen some of it already, to see movement. Movement from with outside, outside the community, kind of like the king, thing, pe you know, things and people uh, outside of our, of our community to see God move in those areas. But also we, 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 we expect and need to see movement, activity, and growth from within our community. In other words, from me, from you, from you, from you. Everybody, everybody that hears my voice here. This is all part of what we expect to see and need to see for this, for this effort as we, as we move out as well. And going back to our text, I want to I wanna drop down to the portion that Linda read today, specifically uh, verses 68 and 69, which is, this is the, these verses here, and specifically 69 is kind of what caused me to think of any of these things today. This is really the, the, the seed of the, of the idea here. Ezra chapter 2, verses 68 and 69. It says, As soon as they came to the house of the Lord in Jerusalem, this is after the big trek, some of the heads of families made free will offerings for the house of God to erect it on its site. According to their resources, they gave to the building fund 61,000 derricks of gold. I think you said drachmas. There's going to be a lot of different translations in here, by the way. It's kind of fun. 5,000 minas of silver and 100 priestly robes. So it's obvious, right? We've got a couple boxes in the back for drachmas of gold we need from everybody and minas of silver. This is obviously why I've parked on here. Priestly robes. I think, you know, the elders need some new clothes. Uh, tonight is uh, the first night of Hanukkah, just so you know if that helps you at all. So, okay, James, uh, benediction, please. Would you? We're ready to close? No? Okay. Um, no, really, the, the, the seed of the message is actually uh, contained in here f for me, and I think uh, what God has for us today. And it's right there in verse 69. And you, this is in your translations may vary. I was listening to Linda's, hers did. Um, what I just read said that according to their resources they gave. According to their resources they gave. Some of your translations might say uh, as they were able or according to their gifts. All of these get at the same point. The idea of giving according to one's strengths 
one's abilities or one's gifts. So what is a gift? Uh, just a basic, you know, definition of a gift is something given voluntarily, right? With no expectation of anything in return. Um, or also the receipt or acquisition of something without you having asked for it, without you having done anything special for it, uh, and without you kind of, you know, giving back for it. That's the idea of a gift. You didn't earn it. In terms of what we think about with regard to, you know, our context, our spiritual context when it comes to gifts, I think we tend to think that, you know, is someone gifted or are you gifted? This has to do with possessing some type of extraordinary, spectacular ability. Uh, you know, like you're, a, like you're in Cirque du Soleil or something like that, or you're a prodigy singer, opera singer, or piano player, or something like that. That's a gifted person. Uh, and that would, that would qualify you as being gifted. Or perhaps, um, you know, you think about the spiritual gifts that Paul talks about in Corinthians, and, you know, okay, you start going down those. Okay, well, I don't play piano, but do, and do I have the gift of healing? How about tongues? How about prophecy? Word of knowledge? You know, you're getting further and further. You're like, well, I'm not a great teacher. I don't have wisdom. Okay, so you're not checking off any of those things, you know. Uh, so you think, well, okay, I wouldn't say I'm gifted. Well, what is a gift? Again, what is a gift? Is it, is it something only like a, a new car for college graduation, maybe? Uh, is a $5 Starbucks card a gift? Does being gifted only apply to that, that opera singer or that, uh, that person that clearly is, is a, has a healing ministry? Or is being gifted equally, just as equally, the idea that you're able to wake up and uh, go to work every morning? Or is it a gift that you have to get up on Shabbat morning, come and say Shabbat Shalom, Bruce, or, or, or whatever? Is that, is that a gift? All of these things I want to tell you are gifts. And it isn't right to say that one thing is a, that's a real gift. And this thing over here, it's not really a gift. You know, the, the car is a gift, but the $5 Starbucks card, that's not really a gift, you know, in, in comparison. Again, remember, a gift is something that we've been given freely by someone else, period. And in everyone's case, whether we in here believe it or people outside of here believe it, the fact is everything we have, period, in our lives uh, is really a gift. And it's a gift from God. And it's uh, whether we accept it or not, everything we have is from God. 1 Corinthians 4.2, Paul says, you know, what do you have? What, what is it that you have that you haven't received from somewhere? And if you've received it, why do you boast as if it wasn't a gift? He talks about that in 1 Corinthians 4. Well, in Ezra 2, 6, uh, verse 69 here, the word gift, and you, you may have that translation where he says gift there. Um, it's a reasonable and legitimate translation. The Hebrew literally, uh, though, says, if you were to kind of try to do it literally, it says according to their strength. It's the Hebrew word koach. You've probably heard that before. It literally is strength. It really is the, 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 the idea of the physical ability to do something, anything. It's strength, physical strength. So if you were to think of gifts or being gifted in, the, in that way, okay, the idea being, you know, what do you have the power or strength to do? How much more does that open up your thinking in terms of whether or not you are, in fact, gifted? If you think of it like that. Do you have at least strength to do something? You know, when I, when I thought about that, when I saw that this talked about, you know, giving according to your strength, I, one of the, one of the idea, uh, things that came to me, it's amazing, and certainly in this country and in other countries as well, the uh, type of things that we, that we, meaning people, have invented for folks with disabilities and so forth. And the one, th one thing I thought about, because it was a movie I saw where a guy was a, a police detective and he was actually a quadriplegic and he had the use of, uh, of one finger and then he moved his wheelchair around with one of the straws. Have you ever seen? I mean, even people who are in wheelchairs really have no other ability but to talk and breathe. Well, they use the breath and they take their breath to make the wheelchair. I mean, it's, it's ingenious, isn't it? The one little strength and ability they have, you can suck in, suck in, whatever they do. I've never used one, but you can use this straw to, to get around in a wheelchair. So each of you, no matter what, I think has some level of strength in your life. Some level of some, in essence, gifts. Okay? Gifts that you need to be thankful for and gifts that you need to use and gifts that the kingdom of God needs you to use. So have, have you been overlooking your gifts? 
Or have you always just assumed that, yeah, other people are gifted? I've never considered myself gifted before. Have you always considered that? Again, 42,000 people came back and they gave according to their strength. They gave according to their koach. You know? But I think if you just assume that, man, gifted, that means someone else. Gifting and having gifts, that's, that's not me. That's the, that's the, again, that's the circus performer. That's the person who heals and so forth. That's not me. When you take that position, I think you're ultimately saying that you don't have anything useful to offer the kingdom of God when you take that position. You know, the Bible says in, in, in Psalm 139, you may have heard this before, that you're fearfully and wonderfully made. And Rabbi Chaim has told me this a long time, not to me, but he's talked about this before. He says, you know, when you, when you dismiss your gifts, or you say, I've got nothing to offer, you know, really, I'm not the real gifted person. When you dismiss your abilities, you're basically kind of thumbing your nose at what God fearfully and wonderfully made. You know, um, you're basically insulting God. Uh, I'll give you a little more Jewish guilt in a minute, by the way. Um, I've got some more. That was just the, that was the appetizer. Um. <laughs> so I believe, though, the encouragement, the encouragement from the Word of God for us today is that as we move forward, as we enter into that, that appointed time, whether it's prophetic or not, I'm not saying, but the time that's been, you know, ordained for us as a ministry and as a community, that each one of us needs to uh, specifically ask God what it is that he would like you to do. How it is he wants to use your, your strength, your gift, your ability, your koach. How is it that he wants you to give according to those strengths, those gifts, those just abilities that he's given you? And it's not according to anyone else's strength. It's not in comparison to anyone else's strengths. It's not for you to say, well, I've got this strength. Why doesn't Barry have that strength? Well, Barry's got different. It's not about, it's not about that. Um, it has to do with your own strengths, your own abilities, and your own gifts. Pray for, pray for God to reveal that to you. Pray for what He would have you to do, how He would have you to invest your strengths, your abilities, and your gifts. 1 Corinthians 12.12 12, uh, says, Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit that is from God, so that we may understand the gifts bestowed on us by God. Kind of assumes it right there. But whatever that strength, whatever that ability... Whatever that gift is, know that it might just, you know, be a, uh, a little weak, undeveloped muscle at this point, you know. That could be where it is. But it's a gift nonetheless. It's one that's there. It's one that's poised to be used and invested and blessed by God. It's there. It could be undeveloped. I saw a documentary uh, a couple weeks ago. Uh, it's called One in a Billion. And it has to do with uh, actually the first guy that was ever potentially going to be drafted in the NBA from the country of India. India's got a lot of smart people, but sports is not typically one of their uh, things. So, well, they're very good in cricket and so forth. But in terms of like basketball, U.S. basketball, they really never ever had anyone in the NBA. So this guy, and uh, you can watch the documentary. I won't tell you whether he got drafted or not, but he uh, doesn't affect my story here. But he, um, it's called One in a Billion. It's a good, good little documentary. But he, you know, this, this kid was... Um, He's from the country, from the farm. No real education, quite frankly. Uh, but at a, I think at nine years old, he was five foot nine. Uh, at uh, fourteen, he was six foot six. And he's he's in his early twenties now, I think. But he like at nineteen, basically, he had fully grown. He was over seven feet tall. His dad was seven feet tall also, uh, but he was like he's like seven one, three hundred pounds. And he's now since developed into a pretty good player. He can compete with you know some of the best in the world. Uh, he's really strong. He's about 300 pounds. He, his body movement's really good. He's a really, if you know much about basketball, he's a real finesse shooter. It's, it's amazing. Um, but, you know, he didn't, uh, he had those gifts. He had the height. He had the desire to do better for his family. I mean, in typical Indian fashion, when they send him to, to, to school to learn to get a good job and so forth, it was the same with him. They were sending him to do better and help the village and help his family and help himself. He had all of those things. Um, but it didn't, he had the gifts there, but believe me, they weren't, you see in the documentary, they weren't developed at all. In fact, when he first got taken to this special basketball training facility in India, uh, the NBA guy that was, no, one of the Indian guys in the story was telling, they said he really didn't even know, he wasn't, they could tell, he really didn't even know what game he was playing. He, he thought maybe it was volleyball. There was a ball, you know, there was a ball involved, and he really wasn't sure what it was that he was playing even. 
Um, and even though he was, you know, he, he, he all, all, it still took a lot of time. Then he went off to the U.S. to a special camp down in, a, down in Florida and kind of went through high school there and so forth and lifted weights and learned how to move, learned how to use this body. He had kind of abnormally fastly grown into and so forth. And over time, I mean, years of weight training and movement training and, and learning English, which was a big thing so he could hear his coaches and going through injuries, all this kind of stuff. Is that, that's kind of what, what it took him, you know? So he had, that, he had those things in there. And we all have gifts, right? Might not be as obvious as being six foot six at uh, age 14, but it's something. It's something that will still need to be invested, something that will still need to be exercised, uh, and still something that will need to be developed. If not, then I think we haven't really appreciated the gift or the strength or the ability. And so, again, how do you think that makes the one who's given you that gift feel? That was a second Jewish guilt piece, by the way. I thought, of, actually, I thought about this video. We saw this video, and it's kind of funny, and you may see him a lot this time of year. Uh, we watch America's Funniest Home Videos on Sunday nights. And so there were these, you know, getting the presents on Christmas thing, and this one kid opens the thing up, you know, and he gets socks. And it's all funny. He's like, oh, man. He, he's like, I got this already. Trash. Yeah, that's funny. The truth is, I think, quite frankly, when we overlook and we think we don't have ability, we don't have strength of any kind, we're in essence kind of saying, you know what, God, no, this is just trash. This is nothing. Or I already got this. Or I've tried that. Or whatever, you know. So we're entering, we're entering the Hanukkah season. Again, tonight's the first, you know, sundown, the first night of Hanukkah. Um, I sort of mentioned it with the kids there. Hanukkah is not about uh, lights, and it's not about presents. It's not about the dreidel. It is about the dreidel, actually, in a sense. But, uh, but it's about the big picture is it's about dedication, right? That the Greeks had come in, and they had desecrated the temple, uh, and they had gotten things out of order. And it's a story of how things got back in order through a, through a military battle, through the hand of the Lord, through a protracted battle. And the fact is that things got put back in order, and, and then the temple was dedicated. So as we're entering you know, this, 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 this season, I want you to consider this idea of, of what your gifts and strengths are, and maybe how you've been overlooking or discounting uh, some of them. And I want to encourage you, therefore, to make this, this season a time to get things back in order, a time to dedicate yourself to identifying and exercising and investing the, the gifts and the strengths and the abilities that God has given you. Because not only do you need this, I think, for yourself to walk in, you know, in, in God's power and so forth, but I think, you know, selfishly, we as a community, <laughs> we also need it as we move forward, as we move forward in what God has for us at this time, in his time. Amen. So let's pray. <clears throat> Father God, Lord, as we, as we enter this season <coughs> of <coughs> dedication, I ask that you show us the strengths that you have given each one of us. Help us to see, Lord, that being gifted doesn't necessarily mean that we've got some unusual or extraordinary talent or ability. Help us to see, Lord, those things that might be escaping our notice. Those things that, while maybe not externally spectacular, they are nonetheless tremendous gifts that you've nonetheless uh, bestowed upon us. And show us, Lord, the value of those things in our lives. Basically everything. Every ability or strength or, or potential strength that we have, Lord. Those things that we just absolutely cannot take credit for. Help us to see those things, no matter how big or how small, Lord. Help us to exercise and invest those things into serving you. Help us to get those things in order today, Lord that we might more fully dedicate our lives to you. In Yeshua's name we pray. Amen. Amen.